Stand for the pledge, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Today's reflection is based on Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 27. I am the Lord, the God of every person on earth. Nothing is impossible for me. We need to hear that God is still in control. We need to hear that it's not over until he says so. We need to hear that life's mishaps and tragedies are not a reason to bail out. They are simply a reason to sit tight. When the train goes through a tunnel and the world goes dark, do you jump out? Of course not. You sit still and trust that the engineer will get you through. The way to deal with discouragement, the cure for disappointment, go back and read the story of God. Read it again and again. Be reminded that you aren't the first person to weep and you aren't the first person to need help. Heavenly Father, please help us today as we do the business of the county. Uh, keep our citizens uh, safe. Uh, thanks for treating us through, so well through this pandemic, both health-wise and economically. Uh, we pray uh, for rain and, and an end to the ceaseless wind, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I do not have any particular comments this morning other than to echo oh, yes. what Bill said about rain and in the ceaseless wind. <laughs> get going. We have one minor adjustment that I've put on to the agenda uh, after appointment to the Convention and Visitors Bureau Board and an appointment to the Fair Board as well. Other than that, any further additions or corrections to the agenda folks? We have a motion to accept. I'll move. Second. There's been a motion. Any discussion? No discussion heard. All those in favor say aye. 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 <clears throat> consent agenda. Chairman, I move to uh, move the uh, move the consent agenda as uh, written. Mr. Chairman, Ms. Lana, I second. Hearing no discussion, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda say aye. 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 Public comment. We have a, it's nice to see people in the room again. Uh, anybody, any public comment that is not already on the agenda for today? See, no public comment. Anything online or that we need to talk about today? We did not receive any online. Thank you. Let's just move right into the business stuff then. First thing on the items is the budget request from our outside agencies. City on a Hill, we have Chris in the audience. If you, well, we're trying to palm it off. I see that. Uh, would you come up here to the microphone, please? And just for the record, would you state your name for the clerk? So. My name is Christopher Lund. I'm the CEO of City on a Hill. Miranda Andrew, I'm the program director here in Garden City. Okay, so we uh, find ourselves here again, like we do every year for the budget request. Um, if I could, I wanted to just start with a brief history of uh, our organization. Uh, in 2008, there were zero residential treatment beds in Western Kansas. If you take the state of Kansas and you draw a line down the middle of it, which you toss the line at east, all the residential beds for adult females were in Eastern Kansas prior to 2008. Since that time, City on a Hill has added 45 beds to the infrastructure of uh, residential beds in rural areas of Kansas. Uh, we're very proud of that. Uh, back in 2008, 2009, a gentleman by the name of Reynaldo Mesa, who I'm sure you guys are familiar with, uh, had uh, come to us. There were some concerns at the time that the services were no longer going to be available. Uh, for those of you that don't know, we're located in the old city building, the original city hall, parole, and all that. That was the original city admin building. That's where we're located. Uh, New Chance ran that for 12 years up until 2007. Uh, we purchased it 
in 2008 from them and have been providing services there for alcohol and drug uh, evaluations and outpatient services for almost 25 years. The longest spot for that particular service uh, in Garden City. So we're also very proud of that. Uh, we at the time began uh, asking for the city and county to receive what was considered at the time ADSAP funds or AFAC, AFAC funds, Alcohol Fund Advisory Committee, which was done through the ADSAP DUI program that they had at the time. It was actually uh, part of the Kansas statutes that a certain percentage of the alcohol tax be applied to substance abuse programs uh, in the local area where the tax was derived from. Ronaldo was really good about it. Uh, we received 20,000 first year, 17,000 the second year, and it gradually began to dwindle down around uh, 2009, 2010. Uh, I got busy with school and uh, we began to add on some services, hiring people. Uh, we weren't paying as much attention to what the city was doing with the uh, AFAC funds. Uh, we basically got defunded, I guess, probably due to a lack of paying attention, I guess. That's probably my fault. Uh, at any rate, uh, when we did come back to the AFAC people, to the city, it became apparent that it was no longer being used for alcohol or substance abuse treatment. It was basically just being used for every agency in Garden City to apply for those funds. Uh, if you did apply, you were basically looking at two to $3,000, which wasn't uh, sufficient to serve the purpose of what we were looking for. Uh, in terms of a duplication of services, there were a few times we've been here and there were some uh, questions as to whether or not there was a duplication of services. Were we doing the same thing that other people or organizations were doing? And in terms of residential treatment, we are the only residential treatment provider for Finney County in this area. The only one, there are no other ones. So there is no duplication of services um, if that was an issue. Uh, we also have looked at, where's your sheet with the percentages of Finney County being so? Yeah. So at the time we began a uh, grassroots coalition involving multiple counties in Western Kansas, we had Greeley, Hamilton, Kearney, Lane, Morton, Scott, Seward, Stanton, Stevens, Wichita. So every time, this time of year, I would travel around and, and meet the different people. Uh, it ended up developing into a grassroots coalition. I met the Mosier brothers in Greeley County. Um, Robert was a doctor, went on to KDHE. He introduced us to Dr. Randall Farenholtz, who at the time was doing the only Suboxone treatment at the time. Uh, we were doing opioid treatment with Suboxone 10 years before they ever mentioned the word epidemic. So, uh, and that came out of the, the coalition. Uh, we've met uh, several people along the way that have been extremely supportive in what we've done. We've been able to add and grow. We added the uh, Reintegration Center in Liberal Kansas. Uh, in 2014, we invested a quarter million dollars to allow us to continue providing treatment services at a lower level. Uh, the gals from Marienthal and Sedan can come down to the reintegration center, stay an additional 90 days. So we're actually in residential treatment for up to 120 days. And then we can look at outpatient services following that. So uh, all the data indicates that a continuation of treatment in other words, the longer you can keep somebody involved in the treatment process, the more successful you are. And we've been able to do that through our reintegration center uh, in Liberal. Um, in terms of Finney County, when we look at just the, the basic facts that we have, um, City on the Hill has completed just over 300 substance abuse DUI evaluations at our Garden City office for 2019, with at least 206 of those being Finney County residents. City on the Hill provided DUI and drug and alcohol education to 275 adults in Southwest Kansas, with 150 of those being Finney County residents. City on the Hill has provided inpatient substance abuse treatment to 208 women, with 62 of those being from Finney County. 
City on the Hill has provided reintegration services to approximately 65 women uh, from Finney County. City on the Hill has provided inpatient and or outpatient services with Kansas block grant funding to nearly 200 men and women who are at or below the 200% federal poverty level. City on the Hill has started a co-occurring disorders housing project, which assists uh, women with identified mental health and substance abuse issues to obtain employment. Uh, Medicaid treatment services, medication, housing, educational, and other necessary services in the community. Uh, we have offered these services to Finney County from the very beginning. Uh, Seward County came on board in 2014. Um, in comparison, uh, Seward County has contributed almost a half a million dollars since 2014, and Finney County has contributed zero, nothing. And Finney County has benefited more than any other county as a direct result of our services. So I come in every year and I try to explain to you guys, I, some of you guys have even been out to our Marienthal facility, um, but I feel like we've been left behind and left out of the whole process. And we'd like to know what we can do to, to get back involved with that. We've done everything we possibly can to support Finney County and now we're asking for your support. Gentlemen, questions? Chris, you mentioned the AFAC funding. Uh, I thought it by statute it had a third, a third, a third, and it, it had to go to organizations like you at, at some level. Mm -hmm. is, is that longer true? I believe that Kansas statutes does state that. I know that when we were inquiring with AFAC, there was, I think, uh, we could apply for $3,000 or uh, something, and that had to be used for a specific. Yeah. It was Purpose. a grant process that we had to go through, and we had to develop a project to utilize the funding specifically. Um, so it wasn't just available to us. Thank you. Sure. Um, Chris, what, I know that you've got on your treatment services. What do you charge for your services? Uh, Where's that on that? On it's on the income under the income statement. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, no, I've got it on the page before that. It's on the last one on my March. Oh, treatment services. Yeah, so we are a block grant provider for the state of Kansas. It's the uh Federal block grant administered by the state that accounts for uh, roughly $520,000 of our revenue services. Uh, people that are beneath the 200% poverty margin can simply come in, be evaluated, and uh, depending on the level of care they need, they have access to treatment without ever having to spend a dime out of their pocket. We're also licensed through Medicaid. Uh, that accounts for, I think last year was $326. Uh, $1,000. Uh, we're a Senate Bill 123 provider, which is the uh, nonviolent um, felony program administered through KDOC. I think Stephanie's here from Corrections. We worked with Stephanie and Beth Beavers before she moved up the hill. We worked with her extensively. Uh, we have a working relationship with them and we're uh, continuing to do that. Uh, we do have a slight amount of private pay clients who come in and might be working at Sunflower Electric or something and they are in need of services and they can afford to pay. And, and those clients are billed um, cash or they have, uh, we're Blue Cross and Blue Shield provider as well. So does that answer your question? Yeah, also one, one more thing. Uh, the list of uh, cities and counties, do you request the same amount from every county? No. Based off population? What we try to do is look at the size of the, the county that we're in. Uh, the average range is two to four thousand dollars for the smaller counties, uh, really, or Wichita or any of those counties. Uh, I think the highest for any of them is like four thousand. Uh, the city of Liberal uh, contributed seventeen thousand this last year. The county contributed fifty-five thousand. So we were looking at basically uh, fifty-five, seventeen, mm -hmm. seventy-two thousand yeah. from the county last year of Seward County. The year before that, they had been at thirty-five thousand for the city, and the county had been at uh, sixty thousand. So they were contributing almost ninety thousand dollars each year. And uh, like I said, they probably are doing uh, 
forty percent of what Finney County does in terms of our services, and they've uh, contributed over a half a million dollars in the last five years. And, and Finney County hasn't done anything. Lawrence, Mr. Chairman, uh, for those on the line, this is Juan. Uh, Chris, my my questions are centered around uh, how do people obtain your services? Are, are they referred to you by the courts? Are they referred to you by agencies? Are they ones who say they know City on the Hill offers these services and they call and say, I'd like, I'd like assistance? How do, how do the people uh, get to you or come to you? Well, actually, Miranda and I just finished completing a commercial, a TV commercial that will be airing in Western Kansas. So please, anybody seen it? Nobody? <laughs> But uh, that's one of the ways. And then we have a, a website that um, lists all of our locations and the phone numbers. And it actually goes directly to my cell phone and inquiries and we automatically contact them right away. Um, we have a longstanding relationship with all the courts and corrections agencies in Kansas. Um, we probably, uh, Topeka, Kansas City, we have clients coming from all over the state. Uh, we've also had clients come in from out of the state, from Montana and far away as Arizona to uh, access our service through our online presence. Thank you. And then my other question is related to what you said at the beginning with regard to 45 beds. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I heard you say rural Kansas. I'm assuming you're saying those are west of this line that you drew through Wichita and Salina. Mm -hmm. And Marienthal would be one of those places mm -hmm. with some beds. Uh, but are, are, the, are there Beds in Finney County? Are there beds in Seward County? Are, I mean, there's 24 beds in Seward County. That's our reintegration center. There's actually, oh, yes, you it. Thank you. there's actually a, an Oxford house that we just put in in Seward County as well. Uh, and then we have a, a sober living house that's um, available for clients who are kind of in transition. They've got jobs, they have income, but they're not yet secure enough to move out on their own. So we have an additional four beds there. We have eight beds in Marienthal. And then we also have a facility in Sedan, Kansas, which is out east of that line, actually. And uh, it's also a rural area, and that's one of the things that we specialized in. And why we put it in there was because it was another place that actually had no services at all, and we were asked to by the state, so we we did. And other than the drive out there, it's been a successful program. And I would just simply end with a comment, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you mentioned Oxford House. Years ago, Finney County had an Ox Oxford House. And I don't know why it closed or anything. I do. And so, and, I mean, so when you mention that, it brings back thoughts of uh, when I was helping them out with that. We, uh, Friends of Recovery now in Salina is in charge of the Oxfords in Kansas. There's over 100 houses. Uh, it's a completely different run organization. I attended a chapter meeting yesterday in Dodge City and uh, I was impressed by the oversight and the accountability that they have now for Oxford. Um, we put that first house in, in Liberal and we're going to pay close attention to how it's run and, and how well it goes. And then, you know, like I said, hopefully we'd like to expand the, the Oxford programs up here as well, but we want to make sure we're doing this right and correctly first. So. I, I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Uh, this day for those online, Chris, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the, uh, the uh, the program you had that I visited out at, at the farm at Marienthal mm -hmm. uh, had uh, women, uh, you said eight, I thought there were more than that at the time. It seemed like that sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but that particular day, the last day I visited, I think they were all at Scott Park fishing or something. Mm -hmm. You had made arrangements. But, but tell us, uh, when somebody checks into that uh, environment, how many weeks, days, whatever, of treatment is the regimen before you look at, uh, at sending them out with a with a pat on the back and, and good luck. So uh, when we started in 2008, the typical program was 28 days. And what we found was we were sending them back to Eastern Kansas, typically to reintegration programs that were only in Eastern Kansas, Wichita, uh, Topeka, Salina. And they would lose the foundation that they had started with us. And then we would see them again, 2010, 2011. So that's why the reintegration program in Liberal was so important. So we went from a 17% success ratio to almost 70% with the clients a year after putting in our reintegration program. So that means seven out of every 10 women who came to our program a year later were still doing well. And the state's average is 9%. So 
we're almost 70, the state's average is at 9%. So um, you actually have one of the best programs in Kansas right here at your disposal. You just need to help fund it. Okay, now I have, <laughs> I have one following question, and I think I have my questions pretty well answered, Mr. Chairman. The uh, alcohol uh, funding that you were talking about that you used to get but no longer do, are those the funds that we now see being uh, dispersed of the youth baseball leagues and so on? No, that's no. different. No. Different. No. Different. So if that, we, those funds are specifically uh, labeled for parks and recreation. Well, that's that was my thinking. For yeah. okay, so I'm getting two programs perhaps yeah. mixed up there a little. But the the program monies that you're talking about, when that comes before us for for an agreement for dispersal. Where have we agreed for it to be dispersed? Do you know? No. I'm, I'm somewhat at a loss. And he says, The only ones we ever see are the ones for the parks and recreation, right, Dory? Because that's, that's, the, that's the program that we manage. The, yeah. the alcohol and drug abuse is what's managed by the city. Mm -hmm. um, they actually, and they fund 90% of that, and we fund 10% of that. But they, they roll through that. And I believe there are some county officers on that committee. Okay, well, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how do we direct some uh, some attention to that committee, if you will, to follow the state law, if, if it says what Chris is reporting that the state law says. I believe this is the assistant city manager, Jennifer Cunningham, manages that program, so she would be a great one to reach out to. Okay. I think there were just several organizations and entities that were in need of funds, and over time, they just began accessing those funds. and. Dr. Clifford mentioned, I think it's a third, third, and a third, which is under Kansas statutes, and I, I don't think that's no longer the case, but I, I can't say for sure. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Well, mine, mine was a, as a general one I forgot to ask. You mentioned at the beginning opioids, and, and, and we don't hear maybe as much about that as we did a year or two ago, even though it's still prevalent. Mm -hmm. But what percentage of your uh, clients would be from an opioid addiction uh, versus just other issues that they might have that they come to you? So I am sometimes at odds with my colleagues because we're in rural Kansas and we go to meetings in Topeka and stuff. They're right in the, in the center of a, a lot of that. Uh, in rural Kansas, it's a, it's a little bit different. You have pockets of this now. You have people that are abusing opioids. Uh, it is a problem. It definitely is an issue. Um, I mentioned Dr. Fernholtz earlier. He used to do Suboxone treatment uh, 10 years ago, and we used to do it in residence, and it was pretty effective. And uh, since then, we haven't been able to find a doctor in this area who's licensed to do that. You have to have a special uh, uh, certificate training uh, to be able to administer Suboxone or, uh, to patients, and no one in Western Kansas has it. I think um, uh, there was someone at Genesis. Genesis, doing yeah, it. has it part-time doctor comes in one day a week and services eight counties or something. So uh, it's, there's really not access to those services, but we treat opioid addiction like we do the other addictions. We treat it the same as cognitive behavioral, behavioral therapies and the other therapies that are available to us. And uh, we don't really view it as a different than any other addiction. That's fair. Thank you. All right, gentlemen, we need to move on. Chris kept his presentation to seven minutes, but you guys added 10 to it. So. Uh, <laughs> Please move on. Can I have a motion, please? I move to take the budget for Prep Center advisory. And I all second. All in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Good luck. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. All right. As you might have gathered, the three agencies, I have a 10 minute limit on you, not counting what we do to you, okay? So. Many County Hysteric Hysterical Museum. It is hysterical someday. Steve will come up and give us your two cents worth. Thank you. If you can get Steve to wrap this up in 10 minutes, that will be a first. I think I managed that last year. And just to make that possible, I won't hit all my points, but I do have handouts so you can take this <laughs> with you. And, I'll, and there should be enough for Mr. Reeves, who I haven't met yet, so great. And uh, also, I think, uh, for Dory. Nice front page article on your flag exhibit, Steve. Thank you. We've been planning that for about a year, and it's 
with Flag Day and um, Independence Day coming up, we wanted to do that. So. Take your name's time. Go. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Well, before I start, I do want to just point out some pictures on the cover uh, of our presentation. You'll see some of our events and activities, the Antique uh, Appraisal Fair, some of uh, 29,000 guests who visited the museum uh, after their, they viewed exhibits, uh, family seeing some of our exhibits. And that lower right-hand picture I just had to throw in because I love it. That's Karen Baird, one of our volunteers, and she's dusting Buffalo Jones. Uh, well, his statue, anyway. Uh, I normally bring some of our board members along for moral support. Uh, but since it was important not to have too many folks in the room, I put a list on the inside cover there for you. Uh, we do have a 22-member board of uh, elected directors who represent the, the people of Finney County. And we are the Finney County Historical Museum. Our parent organization is the Finney County Historical Society. And we have a really simple mission, but it's pretty big. Preservation of the past to enlighten the future. And that's specific to Finney County and the Garden City community and area. And we really have tried to do that over the past year and prior to that through four key objectives. And those are obviously museum exhibits, uh, research and information, education, which sometimes surprises people, but that's a big piece of what we do, uh, and artifact preservation. And in that process, we think we provide a lot of relevant benefits for Finney County and Garden City. And since I talked about those pictures, I want to point out a few on, on that first inside page too. You see the big pool there about 65 years ago. Uh, you see the Stevens Opera House. And at the top right corner, that's President Eisenhower visiting Garden City, Kansas in the 1950s. Uh, at the bottom, you'll see our 1907 depot uh, in the steam locomotive days. And you'll see some musical performers from uh, the Garden City Community Mexican Fiesta in the 1930s. It's been going on a long time. And if you would go with me to the two inside pages, I want to focus briefly on each of our four key objectives uh, exhibits. And you see that at the top left. And you see Mr. Brett Marshall there displaying a book that uh, he published after doing research in our library. You'll see one of our exhibits, the uh, Finney County Soldiers in World War I. And you'll see at the top right a picture of Yadira Hernandez, our uh, artifact registrar, uh, checking in eight firearms used during the 1920s by the infamous legal gang, which was based in Finney County, and that's now part of our exhibits. Uh, I won't go into all of that, but I hope you'll look at that later as you have time. We are at any given time uh, offering about 20 different exhibits and displays. We're open free to the public seven days a week. Uh, in addition to changing exhibits periodically, we've changed a few other things recently in the museum. Uh, we've added uh, uh, plexiglass shielding in appropriate places. Uh, we're uh, doing social distancing, but we don't have tape on the floors. We're using antique yardsticks placed end to end to show people how far they should be staying from each other. Uh, we placed hand sanitizer at the doors. Uh, we're cleaning high touch surfaces every day. Masks are welcome. And uh, we hope to even be providing some of those soon. I won't, as I said, go into all the exhibits, but I do want to quickly hit on the ones that have changed repeatedly in our front door gallery. Uh, going back about a year and a half, we did the 100th anniversary of World War I, the 100th anniversary of Garden City Community College. Uh, historic Finney County signage, our Christmas exhibit, which was a 1950s Santa's workshop diorama. Recently, a whole collection of historic mid-century American bakeware, and we've just opened historic American flags and local history, and that'll be up through, uh, through mid-summer. And we did set a record. Uh, two years ago, we topped for the first time 23,000 visitors in the museum. Um, year, uh, the next year, uh, we hit 28,000, and in 2019, uh, we hit 29,000, almost 30,000 visitors. Obviously, that's going to be reduced this year. We recently reopened after closing on uh, the 30th of March. That's exhibits in a nutshell. Our research library, uh, we're answering about 1,700 questions yearly 
Uh, we've recently added 230 more books uh, to the various volumes that we have, including about 6,000 that we absorbed from the public library a couple of years ago. We had a problem with that because our shelving was about seven and a half feet tall and it was a little tippy. One of the accomplishments we did this year was to stabilize that shelving with some bracing so public access is allowable and much safer in there. Uh, we are providing uh, information every day for families, individuals, authors, movie and TV producers, home buyers, real estate agencies, property owners, teachers, lots of genealogy researchers, church churches, civic groups, government agencies, everybody. And I say this every year, but I do want to point out we are the sole repository for old early day records on Finney County and on Sequoia County, which was who we were before we were Finney County, and on Garfield County, which is our Northeast Panhandle, which at one time was a county of its own and is now part of us. And that includes county records, tax records, census and other demographic records, school records, court records, and even Finney County homestead claims. Uh, I want to talk about education and preservation. That's on the right-hand page. And you see some pictures there of uh, kids at uh, Garden City Arts helping to create our Christmas exhibit this past year. You'll see our education coordinator, Johnetta Heberly, uh, talking to a group of students from Kansas State University. And on the right hand, you'll see a gentleman uh, named Mark Ferguson portraying true Old West character Doc Holliday in one of our uh, recent, uh, recent programs. Our education program over the past year touched 11,637 lives. Those were children and adults, and that's a record. Uh, we did that through uh, in-house tours, uh, through classroom presentations, through presentations at nursing homes, uh, at the Senior Center of Finney County, our evening at the museum, and brown bag lunch, free lecture programs, and also uh, presentations for uh, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, other youth groups, family reunions, civic organizations, and, and that goes on and on. Um, obviously this year, uh, we have been impacted by COVID-19. More and more of our presentations right now are by Zoom and by Facebook. And uh, like the school district, we had to scramble a bit on those, uh, but that's up and running. It's summer now, so that's a little bit of a break and we'll be doing a combination in the fall, we hope, of electronic and live presentations. Uh, but again, uh, it was a new record this year in uh, the number of, uh, of lives that we touched. And then that brings us to preservation. And that is preservation of artifact, artifacts and records and other objects relevant to Finney County and Southwest Kansas history. In 2019, we topped 21,000 artifacts. Uh, and we keep finding places to put them. And uh, it's getting tighter, but we've managed to do that. Uh, when you come into the museum, you'll see our exhibits and you're seeing 15 to 20 percent of our collection. Uh, we try to move things forward and uh, get those where folks can see them. I got the two minute warning there. Thank you. Uh, one other thing we did in preservation this year, we wanted to pres preserve the legacy of our former director, Mary Regan, who spent 25 years of her life at the museum. And uh, we did that by renaming our meeting room. It is now the Mary Regan Conference Room, and we're really proud of that. And if you go with me to the last page, I just want to hit a few basic details. We have been serving the people of Finney County for 72 years. Uh, we were founded right down the street at the Finney County Courthouse in 1948. Uh, the museum itself opened with regular exhibits in 1964, and uh, we've been serving the community ever since. We do uh, spend a lot of time raising funds, and I just wanted to point that out. There's a list there, and I hope you look at those of events we do year round that do two things. They celebrate history and they raise funds so that we can carry on the work we do in meeting our mission. Um, with that, I think I would conclude other than just to say we're glad to be here. We are proud to preserve the heritage of Finney County and to serve the people of Finney County as well. Steve, thank you. Thank you. General questions. Steve, uh, I was looking at your list of events that you 
you had scheduled for the spring, how big of a uh, effect will a uh, loss of revenue on your uh, special events be? How many, how many events will you lose out that you can't reschedule? We've lost three events that we can't reschedule, and we have one more that we're drastically reducing. We had to uh, cancel the Finney County Pioneer Awards Banquet, our Evening in the Past uh, History reenactment, and our Historic Homes Tour. We are going ahead on the 11th of July with our flea market festival, but that's normally a major event with 50 out of town vendors, booths all over the park behind us, and in a short period of time, about 4,500 people. We don't think we can do that this year. Uh, we are scaling that down to one portion of what we've had in the previous years, and that is a sale of donated goods and items on our patio. And we're going to expand that out into the zoo a little bit so we can space tables out. Uh, but we have told our 50 or so vendors, stay home this year, don't come. We hope to have you back again next year. Well, you you have approximately $31,000 listed in revenue for off of special events. How big will you lose half of that? fourth of that we will probably lose six to eight thousand dollars and this is an estimate on the flea market and about a thousand bucks each on those others um, we have been able to access some grant funding to help out to mitigate uh, some of that and honestly some of the things down the road uh, we think we can have and some we may not and it's just going to depend on crowd size advisability at that time Interestingly, the rib sale, we don't think there's a problem with that. The food is prepared professionally, and we don't have that many people in the room at, at one time. Our annual picnic, whether we can get 100, 150 people in a small room in October, we don't know yet. Maybe we need more rib sales. Well, maybe we do, and I'll, uh, I don't have order forms yet, but <laughs> we'll, be, we'll be doing that soon. Like everybody this year, we have a lot of uncertainties we just don't know uh it, it's really hard to predict uh, like i said we we've, we've done some some grant funding uh as well that has helped uh we'll see how it comes out um i'll know more at the end of the year thank you sir mr chairman mine mine is uh, from a budgetary standpoint and, and you've already addressed a portion of it with larry's questions and this is one to those online but your request this year or for 2021 is 216,000. yes correctly and and if if we with our budget restraints that we might have and the loss of revenue that you have from your events and i don't i'm not suggesting a number or anything but say it's something less than what your total budget is, including some of our funding. Mm -hmm. Have you thought ahead of what services that would uh, that would impact? And would it impact people? Would it impact, uh, what would it impact if you are having to do with less, both with the events and with county funding? Our biggest fear is that it would impact people, so we would do everything we could to try to avoid that by uh, reducing other services as well. Um, we would also, um, in fact, we're already planning to do this. We normally, one of our fundraising events is just an appeal to our membership and others to help us out. We're going to do two of those this year instead of one. Um, do I know specifically at this point? No, because we're not far enough into I the year. what the thoughts have been so far. Yeah, that's fair enough. Thank you, Mr. Tim. All right, Steve, thank you very much, gentlemen. Mr. Chairman, I would offer a motion to take Steve's budget request under advisement. Mr. Chairman, I would second that. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carried. Thank, thank you all thank you very, very much. much. And I hope you'll come and see the, the flag exhibit. It'll be up for a couple of months yet. So thank you. All right, next on the list is Western Kansas Child Advocacy Center. Here you go, Kelly. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I don't know if you guys have the handouts, if they are emailed to you or not, but yeah, we have it all. Okay, we perfect. Perfect. 
Okay, my name is Jonathan Harold. I am the development director for the Western Kansas Child Advocacy Center. And for the most part, I don't I see a few new faces, I guess, but um, in a nutshell, just so I don't have to take too much of your time, uh, we help heal the trauma of child abuse through support, prevention, and services. Uh, we specialize in forensic interviewing, uh, therapy, uh, of course, advocacy. Uh, last year, we were excited to uh, inform you of our um, uh, a, a new program we started with uh, is a couple young men who uh, have been partnering with the school systems to try to start what is called a wide trial program. Uh, we got that established and, and our goal is to have them into every one of our communities uh, over the next few years, which um, we are in 40 or uh, 34 counties. Uh, so we serve all of Western Kansas. We are the only child advocacy center um, in the state of Kansas that uh, has utilized mobile units. So how we can serve with a staff of about 20 some people, how we can serve all of Western Kansas is um, that, uh, through our mobile units as well. We've got six brick and mortar centers and then all the other communities, we have uh, mobile units that goes out and takes our services to the children. Last year, we had a record high of cases. Uh, we had 613 cases. Uh, 200 and I believe it was uh, five for Feeney County, 208, 208 of those 613 cases were from Feeney County alone. Our office here on 7th Street has, is probably the busiest one that we have uh, and we are extremely busy. Um, our therapists, we provided close to about 2,500 therapy sessions last year alone um, in which we don't charge our families anything. And so all, all of our services that we provide is free to the families. We don't have an ongoing income that comes in because we don't charge for our services for the family. So we rely heavily on grants and also support. Uh, and you guys have been, uh, you guys supported us uh, good last year. And now I'm just here this year to ask that you all continue that support into 2021. Any questions? We always have questions. Perfect. Let's start a good one. Mr. Chairman, uh, Ms. Klein, uh, thank you for being here and thank you for uh, what your organization does. Uh, my question is is a, a fairly broad one, I guess, uh, from a standpoint of, and, and it was referenced earlier with City on the Hill, uh, potential duplication of services, and, and I'm always concerned about that kind of thing with outside agencies. But my specific question is, uh, is there a connection, and I know it's different, but is there a connection between your organization and CASA uh, who's who's advocating for children in the court? Uh, I mean, is there any kind of interconnection there? You, you know, we, we do work with local local agencies as partners, um, but as far as actually partners, as far as they're tied into us, they are not. I'm not familiar with what they do apart from they are court appointed, from my understanding. We are not court appointed. So the way we get involved, um, the way we get cases basically uh, is we we receive a phone call from DCF or law enforcement and, and almost like a first responder. As soon as we get the phone call, it can be day one. It could be minute five. As soon as we get that phone call, we are, we'll hit the road or they'll, they can bring the child into a local center. Um, and we will provide services for the, the child and their non-offending um, guardians uh, until they no longer need us. So again, where we are not court appointed, we don't have a cutoff limit to the services we provide. So we can see a child, provide therapy to them uh, for six months, three years, as long as the child no longer need us. Uh, and, I, and I always like to share this, you know, uh, also, let's say if the child is no longer a child, but they're a young adult and, uh, and they, they had to utilize our services, you know, when they were 10, they're 21 now, um, let's say they get pregnant, they have a trigger of what happened to them when they were 10, they can come right back in, our doors are open, uh, again, free to them, we don't charge them. They come back in for therapy sessions until they no longer need us again. So we, we're we're there until we're there when they need us until they no longer need us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, question with with regard to the juvenile detention efforts that the county funds and your efforts. Does that integrate in any way? Do you work any with the, with the people that? or being housed and, and cared for down at the juvenile detention center. Is that that's a completely different realm? Yeah, you know, I don't I don't know. Um, the service we provide is actually will be the abuse cases. 
And so if there's any been any kind of juvenile or any kind of that, that has experienced abuse, then they could use they could have had use our utilize our utilize our services. But for the most part, I'm not I, I don't know. Uh, we I, we don't really partner together for a specific program or nothing like that. I do know that. But yeah. Thank you. Uh, my question, federal funds look like they you project them on about ding this year. Is that usually pretty steady or does that? Uh, so somewhat. I mean, we, we rely heavily on grants. So 70 percent of our budget gets met by grants. And so we, we receive a major one from federal and then we receive some state through the CAC because uh, we are part of a nonprofit organization, the Child Advocacy Center, which is national. Um, and uh, so they, they can vary up and down, but we, uh, we've already been uh, we've already been told that uh, we're going to take a major number, hit. Huh? Yeah, yeah. So unfortunately, Gemma, any further questions? No, but uh, Mr. Chairman, I would move that we take the, this uh, budget request under advisement. Clifford, second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Very well. Thank you guys Thank so you. much for meeting with me. Thank you. Any County Convention, Convention and Visitors Bureau, Roxanne, your turn. Good morning. I too may have to be timed. I have handouts as well. Just know on the timing thing, he does not discriminate. <laughs> Thank you. Are you ready? I'm ready. For those of you who don't know me, I am Roxanne Morgan, the Convention and Visitor Bureau Executive Director. And as we go through the presentation, um, the first page is basically just how to contact us, where to reach us on social media. Um, anybody interested in the public can go and visit that on our website at pennycountycvb.com or visit gct visit gck.com so our mission obviously is to attract overnight visitors to finney county for lodging through tourism marketing convention sales business and public relations while featuring local amenities and thus enhancing the economic benefit and quality of life in finney county um, for those in the public who don't know the Finney County CVB uh, is funded 100% through the transient tax, which is a 6% tax on all rooms for lodging in Finney County. Out of town, out of town visitors pay this tax. So um, as a large investor, the Finney County CVB is funded solely outside of Finney County taxpayers. So what we bring into this community costs the Finney County taxpayer absolutely nothing um, and is 100% investment in the county. Um, you'll look at, we did uh, a little bit of an economic impact here. Um, when you look at the events granted uh, monies from the CVB, that fund um, $4,610,128 um, in return on those are events that we recruited and um, events like Beef Empire Days, uh, the Fiesta, uh, Finney County Fair that we invest in that is the um, impact that those people bring into the community. Now for events that we went out and recruited this year, um, the impact of those that we worked with was $1.7 million. Um, I think that is a phenomenal amount when you look at the amount of dollars that are invested. Um, that calculation, I know that you guys have heard over and over again, um, our formula, we figure that at $160, $160 for an overnight visitor. We know that a room is roughly around $100, and that's a tank of gas. So we feel like that's a very conservative estimate. Um, that day tripper is a person who comes in, say, from Liberal, Dodge City, the surrounding areas, may come in and spend money in Finney County, but doesn't spend the night. We assign that person a $60 value, knowing that that is potentially a tank of gas, a ticket, a meal, that kind of stuff. We feel like, again, that's a very conservative dollar. And then if you're a local resident, we assign you a $50 or uh, $15, excuse me, um, value, not because we don't value you, but because you're not having to travel, you're not having to, you're going to enjoy the quality of life. And so it's a ticket. It may be a meal. It may be um, just uh, have a tank of gas. I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, but so that's how we figure our economic impact values. That and any dollars that an event that comes into Finney County 
spins in signage locally in our local stores, any retailers, any printing that they're doing locally. Those kind of costs that are um, is those monies that are spent in any county are included in that economic impact. So, you know, currently with COVID-19, we've had a, it's been a terribly rough year. We were the first ones to shut down lodging and restaurants. And then uh, we've lost about $3.8 million in revenue this year, as far as economic impact to the county. So we're really excited that we're back up and moving forward. And if you look at some of our marketing strategies, there is a multitude of things there. What I'd really like to point out is we have started a hospitality program um, in uh, 2020 and 2019, which has been really, really positive. Um, we've had a little over 200 people go through that. And with 14 to 1,500 people in the lodging and hospitality industry, we have a little ways to go. Once we uh, ended up shutting down March 30th, that we kind of got behind on that. So we're getting that back on track. And you'll see online, we try to reward those people and give them a reason and incentivize those things we're telling them to offer to the public by having the monthly hospitality hero. Every month we do a Facebook post about a person who is an outstanding representative who's gone through our class and, and shows very good customer service. We know if we can do that right in the county, then we pretty much have it hands down. Once we get them here, they always love us. So if we can do that great all the time, we're excited. Um, when you look under tourism sales, I wanted to point out some of the things. This is from a third party, and I apologize. These are 2018 numbers. I was hoping to have 2019, but they haven't finished up that economic impact study yet. These are from Tourism Economics. This is a third party um, group that comes in, um, checks our text receipts, that kind of stuff, and tells us, what kind of impact we're making in our communities. And so when you look at this and it says visitor spending in Finney County rose 100 to 114 million in 2018, 26 million higher than 2014. Visitors spend on average, and this is what always impresses me when they come to me with these numbers, $13,000 every hour of 2018 in Finney County. And that is amazing to me when you think about and then also visitors spent $22 million in lodging establishments in 2018. That is an increase of $6.5 million. Also, they received, um, visitor spending on recreational endeavors grew 4.1%, um, the fastest among all of the spending categories. So we were pretty excited about that in my office since that's what we do. Also, the tourism impact on the next page, it talks about some of the jobs that are incurred in Finney County because of local tourism or leisure and hospitality spending is what I'd like to call it. Um, that supports 1,100 or 1,400 jobs. Right now, I know that that's closer to that 1,560 mark, just because there's a couple of businesses who have opened up in the meantime since this report was done. Um, that's 7.3% of all the jobs in Finney County. So had all of the jobs in leisure and hospitality disappeared, your unemployment rate would jump to 9.5%. That is a huge, huge number. So we're very, we're very proud to be a part of that. Local job holders directly supported by tourism earned 24 million in, with the total impact of visitors supporting 37 million in wages and benefits in Finney County. And there are some studies there and you can see the, the graphs if you have any questions. Um, moving into the tax receipts, You'll see that 5.5% of all employment in the county is directly dependent on visitor activity compared to 4.8 for the state. So we are um, pacing not well ahead of the state, but doing well. I, I feel like for Finney County, we are the 11th largest tourism industry in the state. So that votes very well when you look that we have Dodge is 10, we're 11, and Liberal is 15. Um, so three of the largest in the top 20 is right here in Western Kansas. And we're really proud. We've worked really hard as a group to get there. Of the 90.7 million in the state and local tax revenues, 3.1 million was from sales tax collection with another 2 million in property taxes. On the 2 million in property taxes is our lodging facilities. Um, again, that is Rose, we know in 2019 because those facilities have, have grown as well. So um, this year I wanted to let you know, we did implement um, last year with our budget cuts, we kind of looked at what we had to do differently to um, basically be more cost effective in operating. What we did is we uh, looked into where were our big cost centers. Our big cost centers are our marketing and 
we're in marketing, we're a big cost centers and that's printing. Printing is always very, very expensive. So we moved our printing in house and I wanted to pass these around. Um, these are some of the pieces that we're currently putting out. We had the printer installed not too long ago um, in February and obviously um, Brittany, um, Brittany Swan works in our office and she does all of our printing for us. She has done an amazing job and we're very excited about the pieces that we're putting out. In fact, the piece that you have now was printed on our machine and then the pieces that are coming around, um, we worked with a graphic artist and Brittany is printing those pieces for us. That saves us about ten dollars to $15,000 a year. What I really liked about it after we started talking about it, thinking about and implemented it, we have increased our services because now we're doing in-house mailers. We got a bulk milling permit, and so now we're sending out in-house mailers. This particular printer has a wonderful capacity to do a thing called clickable papers. Um, and as a marketer, that really excited me because now I have a piece. Um, we haven't implemented it yet. I wanted to get Brittany very familiar with the printer before we did. But going into 2021, you'll see there's going to be a little code on uh, most of our printed pieces that you'll be able to run a QR code reader over and it will take you to our website. Gives trackability to our paper pieces, which really has been a real struggle in the past. How do you know you're reaching people with the right information? If they're looking at your digital product, then you have a little more trackability. And so we're really excited about implementing that in 2021. So I would be happy to answer any questions. Well, my, my, my standard, and I was going to, I was going to ask the question about printing because I'm aware that you have moved it in house. So I'm glad you uh, explained that. Uh, my other two questions, though, in in your booklet, you mentioned the six percent transit. Uh, gas tax that we have in Finney County. Can you explain, because I see this uh, when I come to your meetings, but can you explain to the others what the transit gas tax rate in it is in some of the comparable <laughs> counties? Uh, you know, we, we talk about Ford and Ellis and, and uh, Seward and some of the others. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. where, where do we stand with that 6%? Uh, we stand uh, right in the middle. Um, Dodge is at 8%. We are at 6%. Uh, Liberal is at 6%. Hayes is at 5%, in which they have the availability to stay at 5% with a four-year university and a highway running through the middle of their town. Um, then also, I'm trying to think, Great Bend, I believe, is at 2, per, two or 3%. So they're a little lower than us. Uh, but we're right in the middle. We're holding strong, and we continue to, every year our transient tax continues to grow. Obviously, this year is not um, <coughs> going to be a year that you're going to see our end-of-year report grow. Uh, like I said, uh, the leisure and hospitality business was the first thing to shut down, hotel travel and uh, restaurant visits were the very first thing that went and they will be the last thing that opens up and starts receiving business, um, especially with some of the other counties and the, the other states. And if you're going to Finney County, you have to self quarantine when you get back. So we'll, we'll get there and we'll be back on track. In the beginning, the first quarter, we were pacing to have the best year we've ever had. Um, so we'll get back. We'll come back very quickly, I feel like. And, and 4th of July, I wanna invite everybody out to the racetrack for our first really large event. We have some um, ball tournaments going on before that, but to come out and join us at the dirt track out by the airport, we are having a micro midget race. It is a national event and we will have multi-states there. So we're pretty excited. Mr. Chairman, uh, a follow-up question and then one other question. The follow-up is, are the hoteliers okay uh, with the 6% or are, is there any conversation among the hoteliers about less or more or uh, or what or has there been any conversation with the hoteliers about our six percent rate um so we did speak um and, and it's always an ongoing conversation they are okay with the six percent now understand that anytime as with anything retailers are the same way anytime the tax rate goes up um there is a competitiveness 
that they have to maintain the amount of service per the dollar. Um, so they're very okay with the 6% currently. Um, they would struggle with the 8%, especially some of the independents, just because they're having to really fight for those rooms. They really can't charge any more for that room. So if they do, that tax rate going up just basically cuts into their bottom line. And then my other question is related to the 3.8 million uh, that you referenced a minute ago due to lost events. Mm -hmm. What events have we lost totally? What events uh, are we able to revamp and come back with something a little differently? Or I, I know that the uh, you know there's been talk about the uh, symmetry tour in the in the fall mm -hmm. and, and so forth and so on. And there's been some NC whatever that is. NJCA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of those. But can you help us understand where that three point eight million dollar loss, uh, other than directly from the hoteliers, uh, what events has uh, have? Uh, so that three point eight million dollar I quoted you doesn't include lodging. It does not include oh, okay. any of the lost revenue okay. from okay. Um, restaurants or um, family reunions or venues that are outside of that three point eight million dollars that I'm. Um, telling you about comes directly from the economic impact of events that we are uh, funding or in um, fund okay. at some some level Thanks for that they question. have it, yeah. it is not the business there's mu the, the dollar would be much greater if it was the lodging mm -hmm. facilities i would venture to say it would be at least triple that so what give me just an example of some of the events we've lost so some of the events that we lost obviously beef and power days is not going to happen the beef and power days rodeo um american junior golf association um those will all return next year uh same thing with symmetra tour the garden city charity classic that will happen in fact that will happen earlier next year that'll be in april of 2021 and um, we did lose a huge event in jcaa uh, women's division one golf now that will come back. We will not uh, retain those dollars until 2023. We did, and so this is the official announcement now that Lon's asked. We're kind of excited because we didn't know if we were gonna get that event. Once it canceled, we didn't know if it was coming back because that is a one and done situation. We've held mm -hmm. multiple NJCAA championships, but never division one women's golf. And so we were really excited about that because that is an entirely new event come into our community and um, in conversations with NJCAA. We did secure that for 2023. So we're very excited about that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hey, Mr. Chairman, Roxanne, your, uh, your comment about the 6% transient guest tax, that does not apply to, to a room that is rented for 28 days or more, does it? Correct. You still have that? that right. The first 28 days we get taxes on, the last... <clears throat> After 28 days, we do not. And and that's probably not a big deal, except some companies will lease a room in a hotel for... So it is? Yes, room. sir, it is a big deal. Um, <laughs> anytime we're losing tax dollars to be able to generate um, monies coming into Finney County, um, it's always a bonus to us. Uh, but there are multiple companies uh, that do rent rooms for 30 mm -hmm. plus days and then just basically have employees um, and then the budget out. request you're presenting to us today is you're asking the county commission to to less, if you will, the the transit guest tax monies to your use as a convention visitors bureau. Yes. Not any, not not sales tax, not property tax. This is <laughs> transit guest tax only. Right. And that's paid at the hotel. You mentioned the the uh, restaurants, but they don't actually pay into the transient guest tax fund, do they? No, they do not. The only um, revenue that we generate with that we receive is a transient guest tax. That is the six percent guest tax that is on every lodging room that's, under twenty eight days. The point I right. Make clear. I always reference the the restaurants because you can't have one without the other. When you're traveling, when have you ever gone to a hotel that you haven't visited a restaurant as well? So they're a big part of what we try to promote as well. Finney County as a whole is important to us, but those two industries specifically and the shopping are attractions. Those are the four key points we always try and make when we're presenting something um, publicly to get an event here or. Okay, thank you. My point of clarification, is that a state uh, consideration over the 28 days or is that, that granted no 
keep transient guest tax over 28 days? Is that something that came down from the state? Or is that something we did to you? Both. <laughs> um, that's a, the, 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 I'm sorry. It's in the state law. It is on the state statute. However, um, some of the things that are in the state statute we opted out of when we raised our transient tax. So, um, yeah, we like to, you, we follow very closely to what the state statute is. All right. Roxanne, what's your um, collections going to be? Have you seen your first quarter yet? Or I saw my first quarter. My first quarter is a hard to judge it by. Like I said, um, we were two weeks into March when we shut down. And so my first quarter, it still shows us at an increase. Uh, I haven't got May numbers in yet, which I expect to drop drastically. Um, April was good, but I know also know there was a late payment made. Um, so we were still... Um, our revenues in May were supposed to be $89,000. We came in at 51. That still, I think, is really high. Like I said, I know there was a late payment made. Um, so I think it was probably closer to that 30 in real life. But then I haven't got April's numbers to to know how significantly we got hit. So you get a monthly? Um, I get a report monthly. I do not get the transient tax monthly. I get paid quarterly on on the okay. transient tax. But you know, but I what? watch them very closely. Yes, Larry. Okay. So you say you're down. We're significantly down. Out of 30? down to well, we were down to fifty. But like I said, I know there's a late payment there, and I feel like that that number roughly would have been in that thirty mark. Yes, it was. It was a significant. It's going to be an unusual year for us, which. Um, Thank goodness that we have the reserves that we did in the back so that we are still able to operate. I can still retain my staff. We're still able to meet the commitments that we had. And so we're, we're very blessed in that, that we have a very aggressive board in making sure that we're able to always meet our responsibilities. Thank you. Other questions? Mr. Chairman, I would offer a motion to take the thank Take the Finney County Convention and do the Bureau of Budget Request under advisement. Mr. Swan, I'm second. Further discussion? If not, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Roxanne. I'm the next one, too. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> good, th good thing we uh, asked a lot of questions. <laughs> well, since you know that the next one is, and Mr. Chairman may not. No, I have. I bet he does. <laughs> All right, we we do have a board appointment uh, for Convention and Visitors Bureau. I believe that was in our packet. Yes, Lori Jacobs um, from Town Place, uh, Sweet, Town Place Inn and Suites by Marriott. Um, we have a vacancy from a Craig Packer who was with um, the Comfort Inn. He moved to Solana, and so there's a vacancy on our board and lodging seat. So we try and replace it with an equal size facility. And so Lori um, is very, very active. We do um, every other month we have lodging facility meetings. Lori is very active and she's a really great leader in that group. And so I'd really like to see her be appointed to For our board. Clarification, is this to fill the unexpired portion of his term? It will be to fill that unexpired portion of the term. And Mr. Chairman, I would move that um, we appoint Lori Jacobs to that CBD board position. With her a second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion clear. Mm -hmm. And while Roxanne is here, uh, Fair Board is, uh, she's been very active on the Fair Board, and we visited about that last week, month, I believe. Uh, I would like to uh, move that we appoint Roxanne to fill a position on the Fair Board. And if there's conflict of interest. I will abstain. Okay. This is your uh, time to pull out. But no, I mean, <laughs> so I, I think the fair board motion, may want that. That, you, that is a motion. That is a motion from me. And Mr. Chairman, I would second it. Further discussion on appointing Roxanne to the fair board? I just appreciate you uh, being there and providing your uh, expertise and professional opinion. It really helps. Yes, yes, we're excited. We're excited. Okay. It's going to move. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, thank you. And Mr. Chairman, as, as she's walking away, I, I was remiss in not saying she mentioned all about the in house printing and stuff. And I've seen the machine and I have no desire to even get close to it because it's so. I've uh, seen it too. Yeah. And impressive, it, isn't it? It's very impressive. But 
they did the right thing. I was there at the board meeting when they when they heard the uh, bids and, and so forth, and they did the right thing to bring that in house, in my opinion. All right, moving on in our agenda, we have some uh, zoning issues. Alicia, I see you in the crowd. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It is a little warm in here. <laughs> okay, the first case I have for you is a comprehensive plan amendment and a rezone to FC 2020 CPARZ-16 and 17. They're wanting to rezone from manufactured home park to rural industrial in order to build a storage building for them for personal storage. Now, personal storage isn't allowed in manufactured home park, which is why they want to rezone it. Um, and there were quite a bit of conversations on, on this rezone. It was tabled at the first planning commission meeting, and then it was passed um, as a five to three vote to rezone it, mainly because the surrounding is residential and to have one lot be rural industrial, there were concerns about future development, what could be allowed there if the person were to re, um, leave. Um, since right now he only wants to do personal storage, um, staff still kind of had an issue just because there is a large amount of manufactured homes in that area and it could be developed as a single lot for a manufactured home. The problem is that it is in the floodplain and it, it can be quite expensive to build a home or place a manufactured home in the floodplain, whereas in industrial, it's a little bit easier to build a storage building and less expensive um, in the floodplain. There was a lot of discussion on that, yeah. wasn't there? <laughs> there was quite a bit of discussion, yes. Uh, sorry. I'm, I'm looking at the aerial photograph. Though. There's no <laughs> homes there now, currently. On that lot, no. But around there, there yeah, is. Yeah, I see it around there, but it looks to me like there's motor, mobile homes to the right of that photograph. Is that yes, there is a main picture homes to the right. And to the left, there are single family homes. Of so they want to remove all those. They, on just this one lot, there is um, one building on there right now that he wants to remove. There's nothing else. This is a very old aerial. So oh, okay. nothing else exists on there besides one building that he plans to remove. Oh, so these are all gone anyway. Okay. Right. Okay. And the rezone is strictly for that highlighted area. Correct. Gentlemen? Dave, you, you kind of. Probably no, no personal view. I was of not. Uh, yes, but I was not at this meeting. Did you have any any of the neighbors? No, protest? we had no neighbors call or anything. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> they to me are more important than the planning commissioners in, in terms of concern. So if, if the neighbors didn't uh, have concern, <clears throat> I guess we shouldn't maybe either. So. On. Well, unless you remind me again, I'm, I'm scrolling through it, but I, I'm not finding it quickly. How much uh, acreage is that? It's it's a little less than an acre, so it's 0. 0.912 acres. 0. Okay, I thought it was about an acre. I couldn't, I couldn't find it quickly. Okay, and and so the reason that staff is not making a recommendation is because of what you just said a minute ago. Yes, and because it's um, because the comprehensive plan shows it as residential now, um, amending it to rural industrial would allow for in the future, if somebody wanted to rezone to change more of that area into industrial instead of and it is in the floodplain. It is in the floodplain, yes. You don't look like you're done, Dave. Well, I'm I'm done. I keep <laughs> my eye care keeps calling me out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have to go out and make a phone call here in a minute, but I'll offer a motion to approve this request for the reason. Okay, I need two motions. The first one would be the conference of plan amendment okay. and then the second one. That was what my motion was. Could you get that? Okay, resolution eleven twenty twenty is the comprehensive plan amendment. And then resolution 1220 will be the rezone. All right. 
So I'll start off with a comprehensive plan. That was my, that's my motion. 11.20-2020. <laughs> there has been a motion. So so there's there's a second. second on 11-2020. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And now the, the rezone. rezone. I'll offer that motion for the rezone. And that is resolution 12-2020. 12-2020. Do I hear a second? I have a second, Dave. Thank you, Long. All in favor, signify the same aye. 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 Okay. Thank you very much on that one. <laughs> Dave, can you wait till 10 o'clock to make your phone call back to Dr. Dr. Well, Tipper? it's a fourth time to call. Uh, maybe, maybe we can get They're persistent, aren't they? I'll, I'll yeah. slip out and call them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's finish with Alicia and then we'll take our break for Dave's benefit here. Okay. The second one is the comprehensive plan amendment and the rezone as well. It's FC 2020 CPA RRZ 27 and 28 um, at South Pierceville Road and East Parallel Road. There's 60 acres that they're taking out. They'll come back and plot it, but they want to rezone it right now. They're going to divide it into three 20 acre lots and sell for development of residential. So right now they want to rezone to rural residential. The comp plan has it as ag. There is an airport overlay district as since it's a little bit closer towards the airport. Um, and that passed or was recommended by the planning commission as an eight vote. Now I do have a question on that mm -hmm. one. Uh, that seems to be quite a ways from the airport. How far? I know it's in line with the runway. What is the distance from the runway that, that, affects, that, that affects this property? Um, I don't know what the distance is. Now, the airport overlay district is just for distance or for height. So there's a, there's a height requirement that they can't go past the building. So it would be 100 feet. Nothing well, it's can be built. be at least five miles from the end of the runway. Well, it's the um, outer marker, I think, for instrument approaches. Is right. Okay. Okay. I'm just curious. I, yeah. I, no, no, no argument. Just yeah, I, I believe they put it out there because um, once you get right. further out, a lot of times they want to put towers out in that area, so that's why there's that, that okay. uh, overlay district. That's fair enough. Questions, gentlemen? So, uh, Ms. Chen, it's my understanding we have two different motions. Again, on this one as yes. well. correct. The first comprehensive one plan first, is that correct? Uh, amended the comprehensive correct. plan, which is resolution 13-2020, and Ms. Chairman, I would move that we uh, do so. <clears throat> Second. All in favor of the amending the Comprehensive plan, comprehensive plan, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion is carried. Now the rezone. And Mr. Chairman, the uh, rezoning uh, resolution is 14 2020, and I would move that we approve that rezoning request. Clifford, second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion is carried. Are you done with this one? I'm done with you today. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. We will break for five minutes a little early so that Commissioner Jones may uh, Sorry about that. check in with <laughs> Commissioner <laughs> Clifford. <laughs>
we have Lana up here with Empirical Business. Well, I am with Finney County Economic Development. <laughs> the empirical <laughs> tax abatement. Yes, sir. Okay. I just, I just Are didn't want anybody think that I'd switch jobs. I'm still with economic development. I stand corrected. No, you're good. Often. You're good. Uh, yeah, so we do have uh, the tax abatement request in front of you. It has been a while since you've had a tax abatement request before you. So if you have questions about the policy and the process, I'm happy to answer those. But this is the first uh, step, if you will, that you take as a commission. We have performed the cost benefit analysis and the tax abatement review committee has met and um, their memorandum is attached with their recommendations. Um, we did look at both 60% and 70%. The policy for Finney County um, tops out at 60%, however, does leave room for local decision-making to go above that should you feel um, the need to secure a project. In this instance, the tax abatement committee suggested the 60% level of abatement and um, suggested that you approve that. Um, again, this is just the first step. So this, at this point, you enter into a memorandum of understanding with the client. And basically what that says is, should you build the project the way you've outlined that you will build it, we will honor um, the tax abatement that you qualify for at 60%. Any questions? And I'm sure, gentlemen, you looked at every page of those numbers. Okay. Number sure. Yeah, why, why is this? Is the CBA tool just out of date regarding the school finance? Yeah, the, there? the cost benefit analysis tool is not good at all. <laughs> the only positive to it is that it's the same one that gets used everywhere. Uh, it's the one allowed by the state of Kansas, so you can easily compare uh, one to the other. Uh, but yes, the, the tool itself is not accurate. It doesn't properly capture uh, school funding specifically. Um, but it also has challenges even on the community college side as well. So we know that going into it, um, but it is it is what it is. Dr. Carlin seems to understand that. That he understands that very, very well. Yes. Yeah, he has no problem with that. But they have the slowest uh, cost recovery in this. Always. always. They always show Do the they slowest. really have a really positive number? No, not, not usually, unless the best thing that can happen for the school district is large capital investment with very minimal employees. Um, because what costs them in the, in the analysis itself is the number of children that it anticipates that they'll be um, educating, obviously. So when they estimate that at two and a half um, per job, that quickly on large job numbers ramps up the number of children that they would be required to educate. Um, so yeah, the only time they really look good is large capital, low employment. But in the construction phase, they don't expect too many kids to come in here. No, no. Mm -hmm. No further questions. Lon? Just checking, uh, this is Lon for those online. Uh, Lana, the, the payback, uh, just help me refresh my memory, the seven year, 10 year, and so forth. That's about standard. I mean, that's about uh, normal, is it not, for the paybacks? On the larger ones, yes. Um, you know, most of the abatements that we do are 20%, sometimes 30% that they qualify. Um, and those we're right. usually able to keep under the seven years for everybody. Right. Um, but because, again, this is obviously a much larger project. Now, their estimate for the cost-benefit analysis tool, they only estimated $252 million total investment. Um, we know that's probably somewhere between $100 and $150 million short of what they're actually going to invest. Um, but that was the information that, that was submitted when we first started on the project before they had, had identified their location and the scope of the project. So... It should be a quicker payback um, just based on the fact that they are investing more and therefore their tax liability will be higher. But okay. yeah, you. uh -huh, you're welcome. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, Lana, would you, for, for those of us who need a, a bit of clarity uh, and, to, and to answer the concerns that might be raised at the coffee shop, tell us 
the, you mentioned $250 million as a conservative estimate on this facility when it's completed. What's the value of the piece of property right now so that we can show the gain on that, uh, the value on that piece of property and what the actual tax benefit will be? Yeah, so I the, the parcel that they purchased was not separated from the others. So it's a part of a larger parcel um, that was owned by Transportation Partner and Partners and Logistics. So it would be a challenge for me to go back and tell you exactly how much it was for that um, parcel that they purchased. Um, they, they purchased um, right at 50 acres that they'll put their facility on, but that was out of two larger parcels. So, um, but the point being that never goes away. So um, the value that we had increased it to the first time that we developed it, which was when we put um, TPNL and the Translit facility there, that valuation stays the same. Um, those, the taxes that are being collected on that parcel now will be collected forever. And this abatement is just 60% of the increment increase that, that is created through the new construction that they're putting in there. And that's what people don't understand, that tax abatement sounds like you're giving something away and, yeah. and actually we're gaining. Yeah, we don't give much away. Um, no, and with um, with the way our tax abatement policy is set, which was drafted by my, my current board um, leadership was in place when we drafted that policy, um, we, it is a very conservative tax abatement policy. Uh, it's again, um, we max out at 60%. There's a lot of communities that do 80, 90, and 100% tax abatements. We don't feel like that's appropriate. We don't think that, that that's the, the right way to do growth. If you have to give it away, um, if that probably says more about the rest of what you have going on than it does about that project. So we have great concerns with going higher than that. Um, on a regular basis, but we do also recognize that there are a lot of additional investments made and a lot of indirect um, and induced benefits, economic benefits that come as a result of a project of this magnitude. And obviously, um, it's a project we wanted for our community. I will also tell you that the Department of Commerce last week sent out a um, that they a press release indicating that they had received a a silver shovel award from uh, national economic development offices and um, they listed 10 projects that they submitted for this competition and empirical foods was the largest capital investment of the 10 projects they submitted for the state of kansas and the only project located west of salina so a lot to be proud of in that information especially considering it was going to another state when we started so good on you and then my final question, one unresolved issue. Have we figured out how to get a fellow from Ireland back here so we can oversee this? Yeah, it won't be long and they'll, somebody from Ireland will be sending him back to us postage <laughs> due um, if, if he's not nice. But yeah, we I, fortunately, Alan's been able to stay 100% involved in the project and we haven't missed a beat. But uh, thank God for for cell phones and computers and, and all that. He's He's been amazingly involved and in, uh, He's been very nice to deal with us considering the time change as well. There's a lot of times we're talking to him at midnight his time, but he understands that's part of the price you pay. He will reappear. He will reappear. Yes, I feel confident that he will. All right. Thank you. Uh -huh. um, again, I'd like to thank you, Dave, for bringing up the point about the explanation of tax abatements for the public because it is grossly misunderstood. <laughs> yes, it is. And uh, again, uh, I will repeat my comments at the uh, tax abatement committee this this project is quite good for city county and in fact the whole southwest kansas so uh, i highly approve of the tax abatement as well now you're playing a different tune over there Dave. So, <laughs> so is that your motion or no no i'm waiting for a motion i'm just I commenting uh -oh. i don't uh -oh. get a comment very often <laughs> larry uh under uh, construction, I don't know on page 200. Anyway, it says uh, initial construction or expansion 200 million, and then second expansion of 100 million. What do you, is there a timeline between those two, or those is that, are, just, that just to cover their basis? Yeah, those were just estimates. Um, and again, we collected this data 
over a year ago. Um, we collected initially um, to obviously for the cost benefit analysis, but also for the state of Kansas incentives, we have to supply them with the estimates as well. So when they made this this uh, calculation, these estimates, again, they didn't know for sure what parcel they were going to be locating the facility on. So they didn't know what other costs would be associated with it. Um, but there is um, discussion about future expansion as the project takes off. So all of the utilities and infrastructure that we're quoting now and working on now allows for, for that expansion. Future expansion would come under a, a new abatement would they reapply for a different? It could, um, but only if it's stretched out past, you know, significantly past the start of this one. This abatement won't actually go into effect until construction is completed, obviously. So um, there, that if that new expansion falls within that 10 year period, it would depend on where it would be in there. We have had companies, as you're well aware, Wind River has come back a couple of times. Um, Palmer Tank did a couple of abatements on, on different projects. They're certainly capable, you know, able to do that uh, so long as they hit the threshold for either job creation or for capital investment that's in the policy as it is now. After the abatement uh, retires, uh, we've had problems in the past with valuation. You want to touch on that? Yes, and so the step that we took as an um, as an organization was we we put this meeting that's taking place right now, we added this. Um, this meeting is not required by the state of Kansas, by the Board of Tax Appeals, by anybody. We added this, this meeting at this point because this is your opportunity to enter into the agreement with the project that they will follow the rest of the steps um, that are outlined in that in that process. So what we require now is that businesses meet at post construction, they meet with um, the county appraiser's office and they agree to a certified value uh, at that time. So uh, it gives us the opportunity to make sure everybody's on the same page, um, but also keeps us from having to go back and reevaluate uh, the abatement after the fact. I've noticed Mary's nodding her head in approval, so mm -hmm. it, yeah. uh, the appraiser's office does agree. So, gentlemen, Mr. Chairman, one other clarification. So, and I heard what you just said. This isn't a required step, mm -hmm. but does is this a step there they've been kind of waiting on in order to trigger the construction date? Uh, no, unfortunately, they their their crews um, a large number of their construction workers are from the oh. Sioux Falls area. Oh. oh, I think you mentioned it. Yeah, and they haven't they haven't been allowed to come down yet. Uh, but... Yesterday at a restaurant, I saw three people walk in with empirical shirts on, and so I was wondering. So you grabbed them and said thank you. And... Uh, well, you bought their lunch. You, yeah, what did you do for them, Commissioner? I didn't, I didn't have enough time. <laughs> <laughs> I had two guests with me, and I was uh, I was pressed. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I would uh, move that we uh, proceed with this tax abatement and recommendation. Mr. Chairman, I will second that. All right, thank you. Further discussion on the tax abatement issue. And, and uh, Dr. Clifford, just for clarification, are we enabling you to sign the MOU? Is that the action you're taking? You today? sign the MOU, yes. Yes. That's part of the motion that the word vote now. Further discussion? Not all those in favor of the motion for the tax payment for empirical food signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Permitting is moving forward and all that good. On that yes, um, but right now, most of the time is we're spending is on uh, engineering, uh, mostly with wastewater, but certainly with the other utilities as well. Now we've the last week we've been working quite a bit on easements that are in existence on Jenny Barker Road, and um, that we're needing to adjust to allow for the construction of the road, but. Things are moving along well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Have a good day. You also. Okay, moving along. Extension lease with Mr. Poppins. If you will come with your presentation, and we have Angie coming up before. I'll let Angie take the nice chair. 
front of you is a lease agreement uh, between uh, Finney County and the Western Plains Extension District number 19. Uh, I will note that there was a paragraph added after I submitted it, which I appreciate. Uh, that looks, uh, looks really good, but it's a hundred year lease. Uh, it's actually the same type of lease we hold with uh, K-State out on West Mary there. Uh, that's where that format came from, I guess you could say. That will be responsible for the building, everything in and about the building, uh, and the uh, master garden area. I note that you uh, protect us if they do not keep the building up. We can. We can. There's an out. Yeah. There's an out. Yes. Uh, any questions? Yeah. I see Jennifer sitting in the audience and any input or comments or anything from the extension district's perspective? Um, well, the first one he presented to us didn't have anything in there about the maintenance of the building. He was responsible for that. So I talked to Robert, we got back at it because my current board was um, worried that there wasn't anything about that in the lease. But I do need to send this lease on to Jim Lindquist for him to review and make sure because it is a little different than the, um, the standard form that we usually have for the district to um, commissioners to sign. So he wants to take a look at this. And I just got this Friday. And um, so I will get that sent to him today and have him look over it also. Make sure it, it fits into all of their localities. I see County Council in the audience. Have you any comment on the lease? I believe I reviewed it on Thursday and uh, and passed on it. So, um, yeah, and then it was forwarded. I think you after that. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. I, I would move that uh, we forward this extension council lease uh, to Kansas State. I'll second. Further discussion. Uh, by 40, are you approving the lease? I'm just curious. Yeah, that's good. Who, who has to approve it first? Are we appro approving it? Well, I, yeah, I, I don't know what the exact wording should be because I guess I'm okay with the lease, but if he comes back with some men amendments, then I think we're going to have to reconsider. So, uh, so I'm going to approve the lease as it, presented, subject guess, to and, to and, and, and forward it to Kansas State University. That'd be fine. Word it that way because I'm okay with the lease, but I mean, just hopefully there won't be any amendments. But okay, Dory has it down officially, yep. So, whatever Dory puts down, are we agreeing with her? Well, now we <laughs> <laughs> until we see the minutes, okay. So <laughs> Dory, would you repeat back as you understand the motion? So, to approve the lease agreement between the Finney County Commissioners, West Plains Extension District number 19. For a building located at 501 South 9th. And for um, and, and uh, subject to review by K State Extension. That's everything I said. It's everything okay. Very good. Is that everything? The second heard? All right. All those in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is carried. And Angie, you didn't even get to speak to it. It's all good. Yeah, okay. All right, let's talk about something else, huh? All this business. It's something fun. Something fun. Okay, Wildwood. Um, no, no, I think I approved it like it was. Um, basically, I'd like you to approve the uh, Wildwood Parks and Fees. That's my main objective here today. Uh, again, council has reviewed the uh, uh, parks and the rules, regulations, and fees, and uh, they're being presented to you as the same as she uh, reviewed. If you have any questions, I'd sure you entertain some questions. It looked like it was a very inclusive uh, list of uh, 
the grievance, I guess I should say. Yeah, we hope so. I don't think you left anything out. Somebody will come up with something. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Somebody will come up with something. Um, again, the uh, did you ever call again about the insurance? I'm sorry? Did you call about the insurance again? Yeah, I reported it back to the Robert and the fiscal committee. So um, they just asked that signage be posted and yeah. that any events that take place there would need to be um, to list Kitty County as an additional insurer, yeah. that general liability, similar to events that take place at the fair ground. Yeah. May I check with them again also and they yeah. General liability covers. Um, you won't. They said if I keep calling them, I'm gonna, they're going to write me a policy and charge me. But uh, and I will assume under the county website page under Wildwood Park, this will be posted so that the public can see. This, this will be posted. We don't officially have uh, an opening date. We're kind of waiting on you guys and the COVID thing, and we're kind of waiting on that. But all the electricals ready to go. Um, we're basically ready to go to the fisher in the pond. We just got a few more little minor things to to take care of. No. We hadn't posted. We wanted to make sure that the policy, the, the rules That's and everything right. were approved by approved here before Agreed. we put them on the website. Um, Sarah has worked with us. The website page is out there and it just, just uh, to start. It's list, waiting. Right? Yes. Okay. And the same with Sarah's helped us and we've got the Facebook yeah. page started. So you don't get off real easy because Dave has questions. I can see it. Well, not, really, not a real technical question, but the, the opening is to be decided. Is that the, the opening yes, date? by this board? But mm -hmm. how about come winter time? Do you intend? To be, is it your thought to keep it open all winter and let folks go ice skating down there or whatever they well, want? I don't know about ice skating. I don't know if I do that. But it'll be open just like a state park. We've uh, we've uh, used the guidelines from KDWP for a lot of what we did down there. Um, so it will be open twenty four seven. It'll okay. be they'll have a self pay station uh, to take care of that. And then my final question, Roger, is going to allow a camper to go in and set up. Yes, we have 10, 10 camper spot, uh, sites. Uh, and so they moved in there early in the spring and come fall late. They're still you there. You didn't read uh, that, well, did I you? know I read it, but it doesn't uh, say to me who's going to enforce it. Are you going to put a badge on or are you going to send the sheriff in? We, uh, the sheriff, I've already talked to the sheriff about this, and I've talked to uh, council about this, and the uh, sheriff uh, can enforce that. And also KDWP can enforce that. Okay. Either one can enforce that. Right. Thank uh, you. Type of situation, I guess you'd say. <clears throat> we, uh, yeah, we, I guess if there's any more questions about the rules and regulations. Hearing none, let's uh, go ahead and take care of that uh, motion, please. Well, I'll offer a motion, Mr. Chairman, to to approve the rules and regs as they are presented. Clifford, second. Further discussion? No further discussion heard. All those in favor of the motion, signify the same aye. 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 Motion carried. Opening date. So I don't know. I'm going to glance over to our administrator. How do you feel about things proceeding so far? Uh, what improvements are yet to be done? We have to put up a uh, box to that they can collect their day passes. And other than that, we're keeping basically open. There's more we want to do still, I understand. But uh, but that is the only thing that has to be done before we open. And that, that's a 30 minute break. From a personal perspective, I'd like to see it open up before the 4th of July weekend to give some options to the community for that. Holiday. That was my father's warning, Mr. Jim. Okay. Any objections? We can put a, we'll get signage up, no problem. That won't be an issue before then. Angie, you look like you had something to say. No, it's okay. It was approved earlier in the consent agenda. So, so like a week from today or something? A week from today? Okay. okay. We'll do it. Consensus? Yeah, and, and my question yeah. and didn't have anything to do with the, the motion or consensus, but how often will the fish be uh, restocked? They are, we've actually had three different loads show up 
they've been coming every couple three months there's they actually send out a schedule i should be getting another schedule for this coming fall for the fish there's actually a lot of fish in there right now but that'll be uh, decided by the Wama, uh, parks and yeah we, are, we signed a memorandum mm -hmm. of understanding with kansas department of wildlife and parks so that, that if we supply the water they supply the fish and that but they are in charge of monitoring and take care of the biological effect of everything how everything works together ecological effect so it's up to them, them, them needs yeah. to restock it's up to them when they decide it needs right. and yeah. they will enforce fish and game regulations yes sir so they're nice sized fish we <laughs> have some really good pictures of them going in so they're um i did do a uh, look back to try to figure out how much the county spent on this project from the beginning and i've got about fifteen thousand seven hundred dollars uh, tied up in it from the past couple of years that we've been it's mm -hmm. not bad at all that's not bad for a park i've, I've turned to uh, davis electric tetro uh wheatland electric have all been more than helpful uh they've been very helpful if they can't if they didn't they couldn't do it themselves they'd steer me in the right direction or they would give my men who were actually doing the work they'd come out and show up and tell us how to do it to, you know to their specifications and they've been a great help good publicity for them as well yes sir yes sir last option is signage what are we? uh that sign you guys i said it does make it around to you um maybe not maybe they stopped with me i just want to get those? your and those are just ideas and this is kind of the prices we're looking at for those Sorry, I them up. No. The, of course, the picture of the house is what the park is named after, Wildwood. That's the picture in the hallway out here. I don't know if y'all remember that. Mm -hmm. It was a party house for the uh, Garden City Company back in the Sugar Beet days. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where everybody... Walk east to the post office. Yeah, I believe so. Mm -hmm. And it was called Wildwood. And that's where they all went, came together mm -hmm. and had their celebrations and everything like that. Um, that house is on the National Historic Registry, I believe, but at least it's on the Kansas Historic Registry. Yeah, yeah. Um, basically, um, you know, I think we uh, need to put up some kind of sign that says who we are and what we are and show if it's a Finney County Park for sure when they pull in. Um, is there one entrance gate? Is that correct? Yes, yeah, there'll be one in and out. So, yeah, one in and out. You'll know, drive right by the feed self pay station when you go in. Um, so every vehicle but, in will pay a $5 daily pass to enjoy the park. And then it's $15 in addition to your daily park pass, 20 for daily and to RV overnight. If you, for the electrical outlet. You set up like the state, you can buy yep. yearly if you want. Yeah, you can buy it yearly if you want. And uh, the interesting thing about this park is that uh, we had a meeting with Roxanne and uh, Mayor Henry last week about uh, bringing in, I'll talk fast, sorry. Oh, it's just John, you know me? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we had a uh, meeting uh, last week uh, about bringing in uh, disc golf, putting in disc golf, a, a uh, course. Yeah, it's a course. It's a oh, sanctioned a course. It's a sanctioned course. Oh, I see. I see. And according to the representative for the disc golf uh, company, that takes every time you have a tournament, it's about 90 people will show up. So, to participate uh, in the yeah, tournament, and then they'll also bring family members. So time. that has a definite impact on putting heads in our beds, putting people in our restaurants, supporting our commerce. It's, it's a good thing. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, we do disc golf, uh, horseshoe, sanctioned horseshoe tournaments, getting the cross country track out there. We have a meeting Wednesday with the Renaissance Festival that's looking at our site for a Renaissance Festival. For next year. Uh, for next, next year. year. Uh, keeping the. It's keeping the guys hopping. Cross country up and down those sand dunes, that'd be a challenge. Mm -hmm. You're going to sign up. Right? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, do you have any questions about Wildwood or the direction it's going? Or... Commission want input on picking the signage or just let staff have it? Personally, I'm okay with staff picking something. I look for each of those. I would agree. Okay. You know I'll do it. I bet you will. <laughs>
And Mr. Chairman, if, if we're done with Wildwood, I had just a general question for Roger. Mm -hmm. Okay. Since he's been uh, absent from our absent from our presence for for. Uh, it's kind of on purpose, Juan. So be careful. Okay. Well, I saw. I think it was a monthly report or something. I saw that you're looking for some help in this, uh, you know, operators and different areas and so forth. Help help mm -hmm. me understand a little bit where you are with your workforce. And, right and, now. Uh, whether you're short-handed or you're getting things accomplished or. Just a, a little bit of a verbal uh, on the uh, status of uh, your department. Right now, under the umbrella of Public Works, which is the fairgrounds, building maintenance, road and bridge mainly, and not just we, we are eight short, eight, eight staff members short. Um, we're, we're talking this afternoon about getting a noxious weed man hired, um, but we're still, we still have a, a shortage, of course. You know we are under a hiring freeze uh, currently. Uh, but, you know, staff is an issue. Um, the only, what I worry about, I guess, is the level of service that we provide being short staffed, uh, keeping what I expect them in to get done to get done uh, being short staffed. Have they been doing it? Yes. Um, has it been a struggle? You know, we've, we've been working Fridays to pull this stuff off. Um, but uh, it is it is a struggle being that that many short. Um, the noxious weed man that we hire um, will be utilized in road and bridge when it's a slow season of noxious weed and we're doing a lot of things like that i'm, I'm crossing the agencies a lot you know i got i got building maintenance guys out building shelters at uh, wildwood but you know if they got time they, we can keep them busy uh but i'm using men across lines quite a bit to try to accomplish as much as we can well, Mr. Chairman, my uh, other comment to that is, and I'm looking at it here on my desk, and, and as Bill Clifford knows, I keep it in front of me uh, each and every meeting. Two of the six mandated uh, services that we have are road and bridges, that's one, and not just weed. And uh, I think those are two important services that we need to make sure that we're staffing well enough to, uh, especially the roads and bridges, uh, but even not just weed is important. Um, and uh, so that was the reason for my question. I'm going to follow up with an attaboy uh, in my particular district, just in front of Harvest. You guys have had the roads out there in just about as good a shape as you're going to get. I appreciate that. I know I haven't been exactly a moisture problem to mess them up, but uh, <laughs> we have had issues, though. We have had issues. Those it, issues it doesn't large. work really well to work a dry road. Either. No, it doesn't. We had but, issues uh, out on uh, any any shear. And the, the issue with any shear is when you when you harvest, you do, and the bottom falls out of the sand hill roads, it's, it gets tough. Well, it's it gets tough. Different district. I'm sorry, guys. But <laughs> mine is very <laughs> chill. <laughs> well done. Uh, and I'll pass that on. So. Further questions, observations, comments for Roger and Randy? Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thanks, guys. And John. Project update. Do we so, need to take a break? Uh, John I was I took one too early. <laughs> it's usually break time when I get ready to come. Yeah, out. it is. I got all day, so if you need another one. <laughs> um, I was asked to do a project update. Um, I didn't bring any picture. I brought a picture. I didn't share any in the memos. If you want to look, this is Jenny Barker Road project kind of an outline of project location and where things are. Um, contractor will be Spore Land Development um, out of Colby is the main contractor. He's got a list of a few others doing the road work, um, placing the bridge, our little culvert from the walmart ditch they're going to relocate it to the north a little bit where it lines straight up <clears throat> and then um just traffic control and some other other things other guys out there um they had it in mind to maybe start this week i think you'll start seeing uh, utility locates being done so they can start placing and locating sign locations um come monday the 22nd for sure jimmy barker from 
Mary Street South to about that first home will be closed to traffic. Um, so they can start removing the box, pavement, removing that box, redoing that ditch location. Um, as they do that and get into that, some they'll be starting on the drainage ditch or the drainage pond, whatever for the city's pond, east side drainage. Um, and I guess the sequence from there would maybe, maybe start widening the west side of Jenny Barker so they could for temporary traffic so they can maybe start later on the uh, pavement on the east side. Uh, and uh, storm sewer being put in. Uh, so they do project to have traffic available after the traffic to T-Bone Stakes. Well, they'll have access all throughout the project just not through from showman to the highway in. okay um once they close it they're, they're not going to open that back up until the project's finished um there'll be maybe some short day or so closures or temporary places where people can't get in their driveway for not very long they're, everybody has access throughout the project um but the public will not be using jimmy barker public should not be using it not to go through. So your bypass to the bypass is closer. Yeah, when the high school starts back up, I mean, that'll have an impact. It should have some. I I don't let my kids go that way. I mean, I just don't like the 156 Jenny Parker intersection. Um, and she found out she didn't like it much either. So <laughs> she'll take the bypass up and maybe over to Mary Street and over. Is, but yeah, that's going to be out of out of commission for about ten months is the project estimate length. Maybe a little longer, depending on holidays and winter. Um, but that's the that's the plan for that. Um, Farmland Road. We've made some progress as far as right away. We met with a couple of landowners last week. Um, one of the apartment, the apartment complex owners and Darwin about just where right away is going to be in their easements are going to be and how they're going to be affected when that stuff goes to work. Um, I think we have one or two maybe going to be set up meetings this week. Um, just people want to see physically where that stuff's so at. Pictures don't quite do a very good job. Um, so hopefully that starts progressing more where we start getting agreements made and the easement signed. Um, KDOT pushed the project to fiscal year 2021, which really probably doesn't affect any letting date. That doesn't affect the letting date as much as right away and utility relocates will. Um, but it's still on their books. They're still looking at it. Um, it didn't go away. Um, we're looking at maybe a, a spring project, hopefully still letting it the, towards the end of this year. Um, yeah, still letting this year, but not probably starting a project till spring. Um, our ceiling. Chip seal projects are complete. Um, the overlay project, the mill and overlay on Finney Scott Line will start um, around August. Venture Corporation is going to do that, and they're doing the South 83 project, and I think a handful of other smaller overlays from that plant. So um, that's their schedule so far on that. Um, if you haven't been out there, K156 mm -hmm. from Highway 23 to Jetmore has been mill and overlaid. It's pretty nice so far. Um, the 23 West in the Garden City will be rebid this fall. So okay. they had to do some trade offs to get problem with the aggregate with the asphalt company. Wasn't able to get all the aggregate. So they took 23 West aggregate, put it on 
what they could and, and did that East project. Um, talked about US 83 South. I, I haven't heard a whole lot more on the progress where they're at, but they're still building boxes and, and working on the probably some of them lanes on the east to the west. They did a custom fiber line down there. Do they? Oh, is that right? Yeah, I think when, they, when they do that, it's all, all the internet access open and everything. Mm -hmm. it's, it's happened two or three times like that. And you don't know whether to blame the contractor or your locators. Where it was. I have my thoughts on maybe where that comes from, but yeah. so unless you have any questions, that's my updates. Questions on those projects? The uh, chip ceiling, I thought they did an excellent job. They did a great job out there on River Road, River Road, and and Open and Lane and Parallel. Well. Got down and, to uh, Fly Mill and B Flame. Good guys to work with. They seemed do like, a really good job. It seemed like it, the, every day we were getting ready to move or haul cattle, they were hauling gravel. But they worked around us and we worked around them. Good. Oh, was fine. I've uh, been meaning to ask you this for months. Seems like uh, when Humphrey Road, just west of the railroad tracks, was finished to Mary Street, in the past, the businesses paid for that with the agreement that we maintained it after that point. Is that did that stay with the north part of that Humphrey Road? No, we paid for that. Oh, you paid for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there any thought of doing the frontage road from Humphrey to uh, what is that? What's the west one? Boots. Boots. Not unless you put that in my mind. Okay. I mean, I guess there's always been some kind of thought, but it's always those have been company district pushed as far as if you want it, then we... What is that? Quarter mile. At the most? Maybe, maybe a third of a mile. I know there are a lot of business on there, I'm sure. Well, I'm sure they would love to have all of them paved through there, but... Well, there's, I don't know how many numerous businesses on that front of quite a few. That yeah. little stretch. I have a question for John. Uh, Friday, John, I went to Ulysses and I came home by 160 and uh, then come into Garden from the south through the new construction on the highway down there. And they have all kinds of uh, dirt moving equipment. It was all sitting idle Friday, but uh, looks like they're getting serious about what they're doing. My, my question is that comes up and stops about a mile to the south of Ply Mill, what, what was their final determination? How will that highway be routed through the, by, by the school at Ply Mill and the church? Is it, is it get? It doesn't, that project won't go that far. It just. I, I realize now it won't go that, but when, when it does go that. I haven't seen what that looks okay, like. Okay, I didn't know if you'd seen that or not because they got a, a school and a church in their way or a big, big, nice farm. Yeah, that's going to be tight. Kashi Coffee Shop Wisdom says southbound runs between Brakey and the school, and the northbound is on the east side of Brakey's hmm. complex. So, it's so he'll, be in the he'll, the... he'll be in an island in the, in the <laughs> okay. media. Well, that's yeah. coffee shop. It's, you know, that's pretty pretty accurate. I expect at the coffee shop. That's a it was just interesting looking at that coming in from the south. All of a sudden, they they've got some kind of a of an obstacle to get around down the road. Yeah, if I haven't seen anything on that, what it looks like, and I can't even say where I've seen that they bought where they bought the right of way. I remember we, we looked at plans several years ago when they first started talking about that, and that whole thing shifts to the east. Yeah, I didn't. I don't think they would put it breaking in an island in the middle of the highway. Well, they didn't want to buy him out either. It, it, at one time, they were moving a lot of stuff to one side or the other. Yeah, I think it, of all yeah, of that, that which was this well, came from a landowner on the east side of breaking. That's the landowner what he told me. The way they're developing that, where the new the new additional lanes 
part of the time on the west side yeah. of the old part of the time on the east. That's going to be a, a zigzag course once it's all. Well, it's, it, that's exactly how they did the south portion of that already. Is they kind of jog yeah. back and forth until they. Yeah, you have to stay awake when you're driving on that. So, anyway, yeah, that's so probably a good thing. Move the radar level. No, they're not going to move that. All right, further questions for John? Thank you, sir. Appreciate it, John. Thanks. Thank you, John. Board governance committee. Anybody have anything on the board governance you have to cover? Well, I'll just throw it in there uh, rather than in my report because uh, part of our governance is legislative advocacy, and, and they wrapped up the legislative session and sent several bills to uh, the governor. She's vetoed some and, and uh, signing some. But the one that is most notable from a KAC and the county commission uh, standpoint is the bill that was that was to include Senate Bill 294, which was the one to do away with the tax lid and, and replace it with a reporting thing and so forth and so on. Uh, that did not make it through the session, so that'll be up for discussion next year, I'm sure. Uh, but at least at this point, we're still under the tax lid. And, uh, as as we have been, uh, nothing has changed from that regard. So, I thought that was uh, most notable from from the uh, uh, county <laughs> perspective. Okay. Any further? Let's move on to administrator report, if you will. Okay. Trina. Last week, I made a really difficult decision for me and my family. And this decision has been coming on for about a year now, but last week I tendered my resignation with the intent to retire on September 20, September 30th will be my last day in Dane County. Mm -hmm. I have loved every minute of being here. It was a very difficult decision. We originally were going to retire, both my husband and I, next year in August. However, because of COVID and not being with my family and because of some other family things, I'm going to cry. Some other family things that happened last week, it just made it to where my husband and I decided we, I really need to go home. I've taken care of everybody else's families, but I haven't taken care of mine. And so it's time for me to get to go home and take care of my own family. But you, this is such a progressive county. And I think that's why I've loved being here so much is you care about the people. I've never lived and worked anywhere where the county as a whole cares so much about the kids, and you do, and it shows in what you have done here in Finney County, and I appreciate all that I've gotten to do here, and um, I am really working hard with um, some people who I think are great successors for me and doing a lot of training with my staff. They're watching, all my supervisors watch you guys now on Mondays, and we talk about it afterwards. And because um, I really want them to understand the workings of the county. And I just really appreciate all that you have done for me, my family, and for the families that we serve. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you will be missed. September? September, yeah. Good. A few months yet. Yes. Thank you for your time here. We appreciate it. Yes, absolutely. You've been fantastic for Finney County. Your passion for the kids has always been very obvious, and I've always just enjoyed watching you speak about that because because of your passion. And so, thank you very much for what you've done. That's about enough out of you for your announcements, sir. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right, Robert, continue. Um, quick COVID update. Uh, I know that the uh, testing site at the fairgrounds it is open uh, in the mornings only. Uh, still pretty limited. Uh, anywhere from uh, the upper teens to the upper 30s in terms of the amount that they're testing on a daily basis. Uh, we'll be monitoring it this week. Uh, there may be a possibility before the end of this week that they uh, move out of the fairgrounds and go back to the health department. Uh, last, uh, towards the end of last week, uh, the numbers got uh, got down a little bit, and so um, so they're going to run a couple of days, um, Monday and Tuesday, and uh, perhaps Wednesday, and then make that determination here this week on whether or not they'll move down to the health department. But uh, don't be surprised if they do. 
Uh, we have lost um, uh, a, a number of the volunteers, um, and, and rightfully so because of our, our numbers being down. Uh, we have lost the air guards uh, as of last Friday, and that was the first group that came in. There was about eight or ten of those. Um, and um, so, so we still have a few of the guards, guards around. Uh, so you'll start to see those numbers continue to, to decline as, to, as well. Um, and as far as our um, total that have tested positive, I think you've probably seen um, relative updates uh, on that. Um, no new deaths last week. Uh, we're still in the uh, mid. 1500s um, on our uh, positives. 1538. So um, nothing extraordinary there. So anyway, I, I just wanted to bring you quickly up to date on that and potentially for that move back to the health department. On that point, I would highly encourage it. I've been in that building in the summertime and it is hot. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it has to be horribly miserable for staff out there. Uh, yes, the, the, they try and maintain in the morning, as, as we say, and then in the afternoon, they're doing all their follow-up calls and so on and so forth uh, from each side. So, um, budget and finance uh, update, uh, we're still going through the budgeting process, uh, still waiting on the finalization of the audit. Uh, doing the revenue assessment, as Roger mentioned, is that we are still in a a hiring freeze and a capital purchase freeze until we do a complete assessment of, of revenues for the county. Um, those um, you know, related related to that and to the COVID is that we're continually gathering that information and that data on the final cost to date for the county. Um, with the understanding that there is some federal money out there. I did sit in on a call a couple of weeks ago um, on Commissioner Fishy's behalf. Um, we would anticipate, I've anticipated another call this week. Is that cool? I haven't seen anything, but I think so. Yeah. Uh, just to let you know then that, that um, I don't think I have anything with the uh, the county will uh, receive and be in charge of uh, approximately six million dollars uh, from from their Sparks program. I can't tell you what that acronym is, it, it, it is for health and that. But anyway, it's recovery for uh, local units of government on the cost of um, on the cost of uh, expenses related directly related. To COVID-19 and the mitigation of that, and those monies will go out not only just to the county but cities, school districts. Um, it's a three-phase uh, process. It's new enough that they don't know all of the uh, workings of this, uh, but just be aware that um, quite possibly, from what I understand, based on that first call, uh, we should see. Those revenues coming in uh, before the end of the month. Uh, Any guess on what percentage of our expenses might be recovered? Uh, well, the ones that are directly, directly related. So, for those that are related to the health department expenditures, those would be direct expense uh, that would be recoverable, and that's why we're going through that process of detail of by department. What expenses? So if we pay out of pocket for uh, the personal protective equipment, that's recoverable on behalf of the county. Same way with the city, same way with the school district, the special districts, they would receive those those types of uh, reimbursements, if you will, from that grant. What about maybe overtime for all the staff? And if if it is directly related to the mitigation of um, COVID-19, yes. Good. So now it's a expense. 
so those and and there is a uh, federal reporting aspect of it. This is a uh, will be a federal grant, and so there's a uh, there's an awful lot of tracking uh, that goes along with that. Uh, probably even more so than what you saw um, if you're around here for um, the uh, uh, E911 or the 911 9/11 grant that the county probably received a lot of money for, for various purchases. And sure so did, forth. yeah. For the next several years, though, that was split out. Yes, exactly. So we're putting things in place on that to, to be tracking, tracking that as well. May I ask a quick question? Is, is Steve, the, the emergency management people, and with their tracking system, are they the ones kind of responsible for collecting and assimilating the, the facts and figures here, the reimbursement? Uh, for the for the county, we'll be running that through the accounts payable or AP process and through the payable process. Okay. Uh, in particular, because those are the direct sources uh, for those expenditures. We established a long time ago, months ago, uh, the coding process for that. So now we're, we're going through through the process of uh, quality controlling, making sure that all those costs are captured. Cool. Excuse me. We keep receiving an email from the from KAC Kansas Association of Counties saying we've not heard from certain counties in terms of their costs. And Finney County is rather frequently mentioned in that list. So who is reporting to KAC? Is that we, you? Yeah, we we did send them uh, one report. Um, in, in my opinion, I think there's more costs out there that we need to report to them. So it's a tentative, it's a tentative number. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, let's see what other. Uh, really, for the most part, that is, that's that's the end of my briefing. Subject to your questions. Okay. Any for any questions? All right, hearing none, we'll, Lon, we'll start with you today. I really don't have anything uh, special since uh, the last time we met. Okay. I don't have much. I had a, had a handful of phone calls, mostly dealing with when are we going to open the, the library, for example. And, and so I'm here today to report that, that uh, tonight at 5 o'clock this evening is a library board meeting, and it's actually an in-person meeting where the last two or three months, things either were, were Zoom meetings or were canceled. But the determination tonight will be uh, high on the agenda when to open the library and to what, to, uh, to what limits. Uh, some programs probably will be deferred for a while. Senior Center, uh, I can report that that meeting will be Wednesday. And for those, I sent out a, a text message about the Sherry, the director over there, having an aneurysm and surgery. I can report that she's doing pretty well. She was dismissed from, from the hospital, from St. Francis Hospital, and she's in another smaller hospital. It's kind of a, of a swing bed or a rehabilitation setting. And my understanding was that, that they would, they assumed she'd be there a couple of weeks. But she's not yet home, and so the, the folks over at the Senior Center are missing her presence, but they're functioning pretty well, and they have their programs opening back up and the bus is running again and so on, so uh, that's returning to near normal. The, the final thing that I might want to mention, and I appreciate Robert for getting in the, the middle, had a, had a couple phone calls, one right after the other, from people who were uh, in line downstairs trying to renew tags. And uh, the fact that they got on the queue, they had a number, and one call was, he was number eight. And he said, uh, people kept coming in the door and going around him and in and getting their tags. And he's standing there thinking this is moving pretty slowly. And when he finally got through, uh, he inquired about where are those other folks coming from? Well, they had enrolled or had joined the list from online or by phone call. And he said that was not appearing on the, on the TV screen. 
when he left, they were at number 54. So he was there for a while and not long enough to get a little aggravated. So Robert took care of that. And I understand now everything's fixed up. And so if you're standing there and you were number eight in line, but somebody had called in, their name now is displayed on the TV board so that you're not frustrated. You know that, that they made arrangements to, to be listed. So I appreciate uh, that's a mess down there because everybody all of a sudden is trying to get get registration and so on. And so we appreciate what you did. Yes, the, the main thing in essence is that they can uh, go online and, and check in and uh, then then that gets posted up there on the uh, queuing board uh, where they're at. So those that may have been standing in line, um, those individuals that have, have come in or that are coming in, more than likely they've been, um, they've been um, brought into the process either online or if they check in early, and they've got a, so many stacking and turn weights. Well, they go back out in their, their car and, and wait. And then when they receive a phone text or uh, whatever, then they can come back in and, and get right in. So it's, well, I might, it's different. <laughs> I might suggest people who are uh, irritated standing in line, there's a drop box and it works well. Yes. And, and the folks downstairs will get right on it as soon as they can, and they will either mail you your, uh, your material or give you a call so you can come and get it. So uh, they'll they make it easier. That's it, Mr. Chairman. Well, I too have had calls on that one of them this morning and uh, everybody's wondering how to do it. And it's, I know Chris's office has been overwhelmed with people waiting for this opportunity to talk to a person. Uh, Tristan's going to come up and speak to that just for a moment on the mic for the public. I didn't realize Tristan was back there. Oh, she yeah, was yeah. Uh, and, and again, <laughs> she seems to be in the hot seat, so any communication well. <laughs> to the public, I'm sure is appreciated. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, it's, it's really just a learning process for the public and for my staff, too. You know, this is an, a new thing that we're rolling out. It's designed to help control the traffic in our office um, for safety for everybody involved. So to maintain the, the proper social distancing that, you know, that we've been asked to do. So um, as, as Commissioner Jones saw this morning, it was a little bit of a mad dash first thing in the morning, but later in the day, it does even out. And so the queue does work properly. Um, when I came up here, I think we had 40 people in line and an estimated wait time of two hours for the last person. So that's not actually really bad, uh, <laughs> you know. Compared to what it could be, we don't have people standing around the block, so it's really more about comfort for everybody involved. So, does anybody have any questions or about how this I, works? I might make an observation sure. uh, from this morning's. You do have all, a lot of windows open. It's not we do. one or two windows. No, we have five windows open currently. We have eight windows, um, eight the space for eight windows um, available in the office. We've chosen to only open five to maintain social distancing. However, as um, we watch what um, the COVID numbers are doing, you know, we're anticipating opening more of those windows. But we do have five open all the time in our office, not just one. Excellent. Okay. Any other advice on how to, for the public, on how to get on to the phone sure. call? Or? I, I would recommend for sure going to finneycounty.org slash treasurer and clicking on the QList dashboard link. That will walk you through the entire process on how to get on. Um, it, if you go to finneycounty.org slash treasurer, there are also other options. It states you can call in, you can text and get in line that way, or you can also come in and, and um, our people at the reception desk will put you in line that way. But, you know, it's always better to do it from the comfort of your own home. <laughs> That's how I prefer to wait. <laughs> all right. For the well, public, appreciate that. Dave? One of the nice things that has been added with all of this, Roy, mm -hmm. is a reception desk. Yes. And a very pleasant person sitting at that desk that, that makes the public feel better. And so for, for that effort, I, I want to tell you, I appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate it, too. And I want to and I want to say thank you to the clerk's office because they have also sent people over. And I want to thank the sheriff's office because they have also sent deputies over right. to help us just control things. So. Yeah. 
And, and don't forget the Dropbox. Yes, please, please. Um, if you can avoid coming into our office, utilize that Dropbox. It's very fast. They're usually processed the same day or the next day if you put them in there. And for the public's perception, I stuffed a really big envelope in that. They hey. fixed that problem and made it <laughs> we so did. big envelopes. So we, I, got, I did that. we got a bigger Dropbox on Friday thanks to our maintenance staff. So, you know, that that is just That's better. A, I did that for a favor for the public there. It's my, yeah. my bad. <laughs> So, all right. Well, thank okay, you anything all. Else? Thank you, Chris. Thank, thank you very you. much. We appreciate the chairman helping out. <laughs> <laughs> as far as my other reports, other than the call this morning on the treasurer, uh, again, I've had a couple of churches call up and ask uh, what the rules are for the churches. And uh, so there is a great interest in the, in the churches in the community. They're ready to open up as well. And uh, other than that, I had no official i missed all my meetings i think i'm occupied at the farm so i've missed my fair board economic development and extension meetings like a, i'm sorry apologize that's it i just remember <clears throat> calls regarding the towns riverview uh, water situation and the commissioner fishing has explained that very well uh been a lot of travel throughout the district to campaign that's all i have clear uh I'll comment on the road ceiling again. You know, I go by the senior center parking lot by the report and doing my weekly sojourn in there. And the parking lot looked real good and, and they did a great job out on the river road. Also had a uh, workforce one, our annual meeting, and we did it uh, online. Um, they decreased their budget due to uh, less travel and their operation costs going down. But they had also a 14% increase in their uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield for their employees. Um, they met all their 2019 goals by more than 110%, so they're pretty proud of their area, this area one uh, workforce. What they're doing now is um, virtual job fairs, and it was quite interesting. Area one they had over 48 employers set up a virtual job fair with over a uh, thousand job seekers and uh, so the virtual job fair deal looks like it may be something they will pursue more in the future uh had a few calls on roads and sand hills and roger like roger said i talked to him about them. lack of moisture just doesn't work on those sand roads we, we don't get any moisture we can't do much about them until it rains and so most of the people were pretty understanding they should it's pretty frustrating when they're trying to do harvest and the bottom is just completely disappeared. Okay. Anything further to be coming from the commission today? Bernie meeting has adjourned. Thank you all. Good job. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.